I adore horror as a genre, in every medium. I think it's a incredibly unique way to explore a story, to challenge the psyche, to be creative with your imagery and symbolism. And of course, a good bit of gore or visceral imagery can go a long way towards, well, horrifying you, and that can be really stimulating. Now, while I mostly have to say I do enjoy a good horror film more than anything, my second favorite medium to explore horror in is absolutely video games. Horror games have been kind of a staple on my stream, well, since I started streaming. We've played Resident Evils, we've played Silent Hills, we've played the Outlast games, and I'm finally starting to take a couple steps into the more indie horror video games that are out there, and of course my chat recommended to me Signalis, and as you can probably guess, it was Love at First Sight. Everything about this game uh, just kind of hit on all cylinders for me. The atmosphere, the soundtrack, the story, the gameplay. It's everything that I could ever want from a survival horror game, and it reminds me of the survival horror games I used to play growing up, which I think is a feeling a lot of people had as they played this game, because Signalis isn't really afraid to show where its influences are and where they lie within the game. Gameplay-wise, the influences from old-school horror greats like Resident Evil 1 and Silent Hill 2 are incredibly apparent, and atmosphere, story, and visual-wise, we see influences of everything from a Space Odyssey to Neon Genesis Evangelion to Near Replicant. It's really, really cool. Now, as you may have noticed, a lot of those sci-fi and horror titles I said that Signalis takes influence from don't exactly have a straightforward narrative, or are a little bit opaque when exploring their themes that make it a little difficult for a first-time viewer, watcher, reader, player, whatever it may be, to actually understand what's going on. And Signalis is no exception. The storyline is a bit brutal to follow all the details of, even after the couple playthroughs I've done, and honestly, I love the game for that. I love a story that makes you kind of examine what you're taking from it, how you're interacting with the medium and the plot points and the story that is being told, and coming up with your own interpretation. The core overarching theme of Signalis, however, is fairly straightforward. Signalis is a story about love. And you should take solace in that because the more you play, the more details you uncover, the more notes you read, you'll find nothing but despair. I want to keep this video fairly spoiler-free. Signalis is an amazing experience, and I would hate to ruin that for anybody. Nor, if I'm being totally honest, do I think I'm capable of writing any sort of explained video on what is actually happening in Signalis. I've got my own thoughts and interpretations, and I don't think they're anywhere fleshed out enough that I'd want to share them with the internet. So by all means, after you watch this video, I implore you to play this game. The visual style of Signalis is immediately apparent even from the main menu with its absolutely gorgeous pixel graphics. Delving into the options, you'll even see some more atmospheric things that you can turn on or off, things like the CRT mode or the film grain, which I unfortunately wasn't able to play with as my OBS encoder didn't really like to play nicely with those options. Once you get dropped into the game proper, you get a nice little set dressing section where you get to uh, briefly explore what the mechanics of this game are going to unfold. You walk around, collecting items, combining them, turning things around a la old school Resident Evil, and even get to do some cool little first person sections, which are actually a really nice way to help enhance the world in this game instead of just being the classic top-down kind of a style. It gives you a lot more granular detail as far as what you're looking at and what you're interacting with. You don't have much to go on story-wise at this point. All you know is that you're kind of bumbling around this broken-down ship, trying to find out clues of who you are, what you're doing, until you eventually stumble across a cryopod. And after solving a little puzzle to open it up, you find out it's empty. At this point, you descend from the ship and go in search of your missing Gestalt partner. Almost immediately, things are a little weird. 
the destination you find yourself at is a very imposing hole in the ground with just a handful of terrifying stairs leading down that only leads you to another hole. Once through that second hole, the only thing you can really interact with is a book called The King in Yellow. Now, I will mention I didn't know that this was a real book until I watched Power Pack's video on Signalis, which I highly suggest everyone does. Uh, but to sum it up, The King in Yellow is a real book whose themes and stories and the way the book evolves as you continue to read it kind of mirrors the way that Signalis's plot works. And that's all I'm going to mention about the plot. You want more? You should play the game. I highly recommend it. Luckily enough, this gives a great segue to talk about the actual gameplay as you're placed in a mining facility where you actually get your first little taste of the gameplay, the combat, and everything in between. The easiest thing to jump into first is probably the gunplay, as it's fairly simple, all things considered. The most modern game that the gunplay emulates is probably the original releases of Resident Evil 4, though this kind of gunplay is pretty standard in older survival horror games. To sum it up quickly, you can move around as normal with a top-down locked camera angle, moving all around, exploring things, opening doors, interacting with objects, and when you want to actually shoot something, you press an aim button and your character stands still. At this point, you get to use your walking stick to instead move the cursor around and aim at the bad guys. You'll see a little lock-on square kind of shrink the longer you lock onto enemies, showing that you're being more accurate the longer you lock on, and then you shoot them. That's, that's pretty much it. Once you've knocked an enemy down with a bullet or two or three, you can, instead of wasting another, just kick them in the head. This will, for all intents and purposes, kill them. At least, until maybe you return to the screen again. Now, while I'm being a little vague with exactly what I mean here to add an air of mystery, you'll eventually find an item that should clear everything up, the thermite. Well, at least it should clear everything up if you've played the Resident Evil 1 remake and know what the Crimson Heads are. The Thermite is used to permanently destroy an enemy so that it will not come back to life at any point further in the future that you might need to cross through this hallway or room or whatever it may be. Given that normally the enemies can come back to life, as far as I can tell, indefinitely, this makes Thermite incredibly valuable, and to balance that, it's also incredibly scarce. Before we talk about why I love the thermite mechanic so, so much, we also have to talk about inventory limit, a very, very hotly debated topic, especially when it comes to Signalis. It should be worth noting that on release, Signalis only allowed you six inventory slots, and that also meant that you had to use up an inventory slot for some of the more key items like a flashlight. This has later been adjusted in a patch so that those key items, not including actual keys or puzzle items, but these specific items like the eyeball or the flashlight, those are the only two actually, I don't know why I'm being so coy about it, are kind of a permanent slot within your inventory. You can also increase your inventory limit to eight just to kind of ease the burden. You can think of it as the same way in Resident Evil 1, the inventory limits between Jill and Chris changed. Hey, those influences are really showing through. But here's my, my big hot take, and I don't mean to sound like an elitist here, but I do believe that the original six slot inventory limit is incredibly crucial to the entire way that the gameplay is paced. Not that the higher inventory limits ruin it or anything, but I can notice my play was a little weird when I was given those permanent inventory slots. The big one being that I always had my flashlight on me. There was no reason not to have it on you since it didn't take an inventory slot, and the only thing it did was kind of deprive you of your equip slot, which typically has your stun batons or your auto injectors. What this meant gameplay-wise was that any dark room was significantly decreased in any sort of tension or planning that I would need to actually combat it. These flashlight required zones, I think, are really supposed to be something that you have to be prepared to conquer, that you have to go back to your supply box and be ready to go out just to get through this one little room. It adds a huge amount of tension that is just taken away slightly when the flashlight is just permanently on you. The other downside is I didn't really realize I had my flashlight on at some times and it would make stealthing through some of the enemies incredibly difficult, but I don't actually want to knock that against anything. I'm going to chalk that up to a skill issue on my part. 
okay, so I've kind of talked about the quirks to the updates and why they maybe weren't my favorite thing in the world, but why did I like the original six inventory slot limit so much? For me, this really comes down to the map design and the way that you explore and progress through the different areas. Something Power Pack mentioned in their video that I still think you should all watch after you've played the game is this kind of philosophy of Silent Hill versus Resident Evil when it comes to their gameplay structures. Now, while Power Pack posits that the game kind of takes on a more Silent Hill gameplay style, I actually think the opposite, and very much think this sits pretty snugly in the Resident Evil realm of gameplay and exploration. To be slightly more specific, when I play through Silent Hill 2, I'm mostly just going room to room, hallway to hallway, area to area. This isn't necessarily a bad way to play, but there's not a lot of reason for me to back up to a save point or for me to retrace my steps other than when the game actually requires me to backtrack after getting a key item or a puzzle piece. When I play something like the Resident Evil Remake, however, I feel very differently. The game kind of takes on a home base structure when it comes to the save points and the storage boxes within them. I have to plan out every little excursion that I do when I leave from this safe room. Oh, did I see ammo earlier? Maybe I'll try to make a beeline for that and then come back to the safe room, maybe pick up a key item along the way, or maybe it's time for me to finally tackle a new room that I haven't explored yet, maybe even a dark room that I'll need to sacrifice one of my inventory slots for a flashlight with, making it that much more harrowing to actually traverse these areas. I don't want to be too much of a Monster Hunter nerd here, but my favorite thing about Monster Hunter is preparing for the hunts, figuring what items you gotta go out with, what food buffs to eat, and when I play Resident Evil Remake, or Signalis in this case, it very much feels the same. I have to come up with my own set of tasks, my own areas I want to progress through, my own items that I was forced to miss on previous entries, the amount of empty inventory slots I need to keep open just so that I can pick up these items that I may or may not come across when exploring new rooms. There's a lot that goes into thinking how you progress and explore these areas in Signalis, and the Thermite is just the cherry on top. When you are exploring through these areas, often when you have the Thermite, you won't know what hallways, what rooms, what areas are going to either have a ton of zombies that will be reviving, or even which rooms will have heavy foot traffic that you'll be traveling through a lot. It makes when to use the thermite kind of an educated guess that you need to make, that you need to risk. And when you get the answer right and find yourself backtracking through an area that you already thermited up, it honestly feels really nice. It feels like you gave yourself a nice little breather. I adore this tense, methodical, planned style of exploration, but I can totally see why this may not be other people's cup of tea and why they did eventually patch the inventory limits to be slightly more forgiving. Definitely, I don't think that anyone who plays with the higher inventory limits, I mean, hell, I did on my first playthrough, is a worse gamer or anything, but I just think it adds to the experience when you're playing with those really limited resource slots. Okay, I've babbled enough about the gameplay on the combat. I love it. I hope I sold you on it. It really elicits old school survival horror, and that is an awesome, awesome thing. So now let's talk about something else in Signalis that is just as excellent, the audio and the visual design. Let's start with audio because I just need to get it out of the way early. It's exceptional. The soundtracks are absolutely stellar. They add just the perfect amount of tension, or during the cutscenes, they add the perfect amount of whatever feeling those cutscenes may or may not want you to elicit. The sound design itself really, really shines when it comes to kind of the ambient sounds, especially in some of the later sections of the games, or the enemies themselves. Whether that be the screams that happen every time you actually aggro an enemy, the mild screen shakes that you'll see, or even some of the later enemies that kind of cause a glitchy audio effect and force you to do things like tune your radio to the right station just to be able to defeat them. Speaking of the radio modular, it's probably one of my favorite things about this game. 
it doubles both as a puzzle solver and a narrative device, and fits pretty seamlessly within you and your menus and the gameplay itself, allowing you to change the radio station or tune the frequency on the fly as you're traversing the overworld. A lot of the puzzles that use the radio module are incredibly unique and even come with their own kind of wartime, think number station kind of a vibe. It's very, very cool. And there's even a bit of a secret if you examine through some of the radio's frequencies in different areas of the game. I won't spoil that as I actually don't know how to do a lot of that stuff myself, but just know that as you're traversing through the game, you'll occasionally pick up some sounds or some words coming through on your radio when you're not expecting it. And then there's the visual design. Oh my gosh, I love the way this game looks. It's, it's retro sci-fi vibe is so absolutely stellar, coupled with the very like glitchy techno moments where your HUD is overcome with a bunch of images and stuff like that. It's all just so, so good. And it's even narratively sound too. Like I won't spoil it, but there's a narrative reason why there is a bunch of retro tech in the world. It's really, really cool, and the fact that it all fits thematically is nothing short of stellar. It's a very, very cohesive experience when it comes to the gameplay, the narrative, the sound design, and the visual design. All this to say that this game is really, really stellar, especially for the Studio Rose engine, which, as far as I can tell, is just two people. They, of course, had some help with some external composers, but the fact that those composers were able to capture exactly the vibe that this game was going for so well and just add to the experience is absolutely amazing. All this to say, Signalis is one of the best games I've played in recent memory, and probably one of the best old school survival horror games I've played as well. I think I might actually like it more than the Resident Evil remake, which is saying something because I absolutely adore that game. Is the game 100% perfect? Well, not really. In my opinion, no game really is. There are a couple things that can be a little frustrating as you're navigating through the world. Some of the visual noise, while incredibly thematic, can also be quite jarring and not super easy on the eyes. And in what can pretty much be considered a staple to the survival horror genre, a lot of the puzzles can be a little contrived, maybe just collect-a-thons of various things, or even have solutions that are borderline nonsensical. But without a doubt, I think this game has reserved its spot in excellent survival horror games. And the fact that the story is so stellar on top of it, a story that makes you want to think, a story that makes you want to figure out the mystery, a story that, in the end, might not even give you all the answers you want and forces you to make your own interpretations, is really, really amazing. Signalis is something special, and I'm very glad that I've played it.